Hi guys, David here with another science update. Today the first article that I want to talk about is an article about making starch from carbon dioxide. So I'm reading this article from phys.org and it says Chinese scientists report starch synthesis from carbon dioxide. And so starch obviously is a polymer of glucose, which is the main way that plants store energy and as such it is a major constituent of most people's diets. So I'm just taking a look at this figure from uh, the paper and it shows that you have, um, so the idea is to make starch from CO2, right? So we have this, this part up here of the figure shows, shows CO2 combining, combining with H2O um, in the presence of a zinc catalyst which makes methanol. And so methanol then drips down to the next process. I don't know if it actually drips down, but it goes into the next process where methanol is reacted with various enzymes to form formaldehyde. And then this compound DHA or dihydroxyacetone, which is a three carbon sugar. And from there, further enzymes will uh, convert it to six carbon sugars and then eventually actually build it up into starches like amylose and amylopectin. And so the significance of this is that this type of thing, or it'll be a little bit of a different chemical route, but the process of making starch is something that generally speaking or universally speaking happens in plants. And what these scientists have done is actually make an artificial starch synthesis route from CO2. And that has a lot of interesting implications. And so for one thing, they say the new route makes it possible to shift the mode of starch production from traditional agricultural planting to industrial manufacturing and opens up a new technical route for synthesizing complex molecules from CO2. And that's very interesting because uh, on a couple of levels, for one thing, making complex molecules from CO2 is basically what plants specialize at, right? Photosynthesis is all about taking CO2 and water and building up complex molecules from that. But this type of synthetic problem has often eluded human chemists because it's it's pretty difficult. But it looks like these scientists have done a pretty good job with it. So they claim it has some environmental impacts which are interesting. So for one thing they say, strategies for the sustainable supply of starch and use of CO2 are urgently needed to overcome major challenges of mankind such as the food crisis and climate change. One reason why they think that it's going to have an important impact uh, on the environment is that according to the current technical parameters, the annual production of starch in a one cubic meter bioreactor could theoretically make as much starch as growing a third of a hectare of maize. Um, so a third of a hectare is a little less than an acre. So we're talking about like a, a bioreactor that's the size of something you could fit in your arms is growing as much starch as as a small field. They do point out uh, that say without considering the energy input. So I do imagine that this process requires a lot of energy compared to just, you know, harnessing the sun's energy for growing plants. They say if the overall cost of the process can be reduced to a level economically comparable with agricultural planting in the future, it is expected to save more than 90% of cultivated land and freshwater resources. So the idea is, I guess, that we could grow all of our food in um, chemical reactor tanks and then we could just let nature, you know, revert back to wilderness or maybe make epic national parks. Personally, I, I kind of hate that idea. I think that this is a really neat thing that they can make this, but I don't really want to eat chemical reaction starch. I would rather eat just, you know, potatoes and things like that. But they do make a point that it would also help to avoid the negative Im environmental impact of using pesticides and fertilize fertilizers, improve human food security, facilitate a carbon neutral bioeconomy, and uh, and that's that's those are pretty good things. What I got excited about actually is the potential of this if you if we brought it to space with us. So if we brought it to Mars in particular, then the idea that we could maybe chemically make our food from CO2 and maybe other chemicals that we might find on other planets. That could be very viable. And at that point, I think that if you're on Mars and the choices are to eat starch from a bioreactor 
or not eat at all, you'll probably choose the bioreactor food. That being said, I'm not really in a hurry to start eating, um, have all of my food come from large scale chemical reactions. I'd rather they come from chemical reactions in plants, but you know, maybe that's just, uh, maybe that, maybe I'm just being old fashioned. What do you think? Let, let me know in the comments if, uh, if you would eat bioreactor food. So the next article that I want to talk about is a little bit different and I'm not going to read much of it, but I just wanted to share it because I think it's a really excellent piece. It's uh, from thescientist.com and it's from this guy Ahmed Al-Khatib. I don't know if I said his name right. He writes this article about, his opinion article is, scientists must combat scientific dogmatism. And in the article, he talks about a lot of what's gone, gone on with COVID-19 and people talking about uh, what is science and calling people anti-science for having a certain viewpoint surrounding these topics. And his point is that the scientific method, which is built on a solid foundation of skepticism, is anti-authoritarian by nature and has no figureheads. In other words, the idea that, that let's say the news media knows what the scientific viewpoint is and to disagree with that viewpoint is unscientific is basically overall that that way of thinking about things is highly unscientific because if you are a scientist uh, then you know that to do science correctly means that you're always arguing if you're in a situation and you get up and you give a presentation and you present data and you said, this is the way that I think this small pocket of reality works. Here's my data for that. Everyone in the audience who is a trained scientist has been trained their entire education and career to look at data, listen to claims made based on that data and take those claims apart. And then if your claims survive the brutal scrutiny of that process, then it's good. That's what science is. Science is putting forth data, drawing inferences from it, and getting your inferences completely exploded by every possible angle. And if you survive, then you're doing it well. Or if, if, you don't, if your ideas don't su survive, you're doing it well. And so the idea that in my opinion, you know, we're here in September 2021. We've had about a year and a half of the media just kind of saying, well, this is the scientific view or this is not the scientific view. And what I want to know is who made these different media outlets the arbiter for what is or is not scientific? And I'm not even putting forth a, 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 a certain viewpoint. My guess is that if you're listening to me, you're probably thinking, oh, this guy has um, a certain opinion, or this guy has this other opinion. You'd probably be surprised about what my opinions are. Um, I'm not going to talk about what they are, but the point is that this, this nugget here is, it is as unscientific to blindly trust scientists as it is to dismiss them. And, and he finishes with, an ideal science-based society is one without entrenched ideology, yours or theirs. It's only ideology is to constantly evolve and adjust its worldviews. Progress is a process, not a destination. And I think that's exactly right. I think I encourage you to read the article. It's a, it's a very good one. But the reminder is that being scientific is not about looking down on other people's opinions without examining them. It's more about looking at data and carefully thinking as to whether you're making the right conclusions based on that data, and then being willing to update your opinion as you get more information. So on a completely different note, the last article that I want to talk about today is just really cute. It's from fizz.org and it's, uh, it says vampire bats may coordinate with friends over a bite to eat. And it says that vampire bats that form bonds in captivity and continue those friendships in the wild also hunt together, meeting up over a meal after independent departures from the roost, according to a new study. So researchers at attached tiny backpack computers to 50 vampire bats, some of which had been previously been in captivity together and others had lived in the wild, and they tracked their movement during their nightly foraging out outings. By day, the bats shared a hollow tree in Panama, and at night, they obtained their meals by drinking blood from wounds they made on cows in nearby pastures. 
the tracking data showed that vampire bats bats set out to forage separately so they went out you know not as a group but they went out separate ways and those that had had established social relationships with each other would reunite during the hunt for what the researchers speculated was some sort of coordination over food so the findings suggest that making friends in the roost could create more interdependence among socially bonded vampire bats, meaning they could benefit from each other's success at obtaining meals and join forces when competing with other groups for food resources. So I don't know why, it's kind of gross because they're vampire bats, but it's also really cute to think about these uh, bats kind of like, you know, s separating at night and then coming back and kind of sharing a meal and 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 apparently they vocalize to each other so they sort of talk to each other kind of yeah i thought that was that was really cute so thanks again for watching this has been another science update i hope you will join me again in the future soon bye